This morning we continue our work through the book of Mark, and we'll be looking at Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45 this morning. In your pew Bibles in front of you, that's found on page 1006. Again, our story continues in Mark chapter 10, 32 through 45, page 1006 in your pew Bibles. Here we read, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, They began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered ruler of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But if you, but it shall not be um, so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, for those of you that took a peek at your bulletin this morning, you will notice that there are labeled in front of you sermon at number one, and sermon number two. Let me go ahead and explain myself. When looking at the book of Mark, we've been, as I've said, focusing on what it teaches us about the role of discipleship, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And obviously, once again in this text, there's a great deal of teaching upon that area. However, There's also an awful lot in this text that really focuses on who Jesus was and why he came, which presented me with a dilemma. I didn't want to preach a sermon where one of those themes was diluted because of the other. I didn't want to hop back and forth between those two themes and preach a a divided message. And so what I determined to do for you this morning was to preach two different sermons. One that will focus on the role of discipleship and what this text teaches us about that. The other, and what it teaches us about Jesus. Now, for those of you who are now looking at your watches, wondering how long is this going to take? First of all, shame on you. And (laughs) secondly, I assure you that by word count, these both are half sermons and so it should take no longer than if just one sermon were prepared. So first, Let's start by focusing our attention on what this text teaches us about Jesus. 
And right away, there's some very interesting details that get revealed. First of all, we are told uh, from the beginning that once again, we're reminded of the fact that Jesus is on his way toward Jerusalem. He's walking there with his disciples. He's walking probably with a broader crowd of people that are starting to make their way to this important city for the Passover festival. But while walking and while getting closer and closer to Jerusalem, we're told that Jesus is out ahead of everybody. He's walking with a determination and and with a, a vibrancy to his step that surprises them. In fact, We are told of a few things of the way that the disciples in the crowd react to what they are seeing in Jesus. Right away, and it struck out out at me the first time I read over this text in preparation for this morning. We are told, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. Amazed and afraid. And as I thought about those words, it immediately led to a couple of questions. Why? Why were they amazed and afraid? And what were they amazed and afraid about? Well, to address that question, let's start by trying to put ourselves in their shoes and to see things from their perspective. This whole time that they had been following Jesus around, two different things were happening simultaneously. The first was as they watched Jesus, their awe and their amazement at who he was continued to grow. Jesus was that person we just sang about. He walked on water. He calmed storms with his voice, with his commands. Demon fled those who were possessed. He healed people of their diseases, ailments with his touch. He fed thousands. He rose people from the dead. And he taught with such wisdom. And because of that, throughout this time, people's impression of who this was and the possibility that he could be that promised Messiah from the Old Testament continued to grow. At the very same time, opposition to Jesus also continued to grow. We have noticed over and over again that the religious leaders who were from Jerusalem had been following him around, watching what he was doing, listening to him very carefully, and taking every opportunity they had to challenge him, to test him, to criticize him, to interfere with his disciples. And so we've seen their determination to oppose Jesus grow. And those two things are now coming to a head. As Jesus is making his way toward Jerusalem, he's walking into the very den of his opponents. And now it seems like a clash is inevitable and a clash is right around the corner. It looks like the revolution is just about to begin. And so in that perspective, in their shoes, we understand why they are amazed. Here's this man. He carries no sword. He has no army to speak of. He hasn't revealed any determined plan of attack or strategy shared with his disciples and his his fellow teams around him. And yet, here he is walking right to Jerusalem, ready to start this revolution, to reveal himself as the Messiah. That's amazing. But we also understand why they're afraid. Like the people watching the weather reports as they see the news of the hurricane getting closer and closer to their land, they start to ask those really big questions. What is this really going to look like? Who's going to start the battle? Are we really prepared or ultimately am I going to be safe? And in those unknowns and in those questions, they're understandably afraid. Now, while we get the image of those who are confused about who Jesus was, still misunderstanding what it meant for him to be the Messiah, we also learn in this text 
what Jesus was actually going to Jerusalem to do. And again, to remind ourselves and refresh our memory, this is the third time that Jesus speaks openly and plainly about what he is about to do. Back in chapter 6, verse 31, and the beginning of verse 32, we are told for the first time that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. In chapter 9, verse 31, he added to that and he said, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. And now, for the third time, in verses 33 and 34 of our text this morning, he says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Now notice, each time we're getting more detailed about what is awaiting Jesus in Jerusalem. This time... Uh, quite a bit more details. This is the first time that we learn that Jerusalem is the place where all of this is going to happen. It's the first time that we learn that Jesus will not only be rejected by the religious leaders and the Jewish leaders, but that he will also be turned over to the Gentiles and be rejected and condemned by them as well. We get much greater detail of the humiliation that awaits Jesus in Jerusalem, flogging, beating, spitting, and death. While the disciples and the others may still be confused by all of this, it is abundantly clear that Jesus knows exactly what is going to happen to him in Jerusalem. Now, if you know this, if you are aware that the hurricane is coming and that the damage will be severe, what do you do? You run away. You pack up and you go in the opposite direction. You save your life. You protect yourself. You bunker down and you avoid the danger. To do otherwise is foolish or heroic. And so, for those who are starting to actually listen to what Jesus had been trying to tell them all along, they too would be amazed. You say that you're going to be arrested and persecuted, spit on, flogged, beaten, and, and killed? Why are you going toward Jerusalem? Why are you walking toward this, out ahead of everyone else? It's amazing. We could also understand why they would be afraid. Well, what is this going to mean? What is this going to do with all of the momentum that has been built up? What does this mean for us? And, and how is this mission, this work, going to continue if Jesus dies in this way? But in addition to all of the details about Jesus' death that we get in this part of Mark, the greatest addition comes at the very end of the text when we not only learn more about what will happen to Jesus, but for the very first time in the clearest of language, we start to learn about why all of this is going to happen. Verse 45 is what many have called the, the theme verse for the whole book of Mark. And in it we hear Jesus explain, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The reason that Jesus was going toward Jerusalem rather than running away from it was quite simply because this is the very reason why he had come at all. His arrest, his suffering, and death were no accident that he stumbled into. He wasn't surprised when he got to Jerusalem and everything started falling apart unexpectedly. No. 
Jesus knew exactly what would take place, and more importantly, he knew why, and that is why he went. He was going to be a ransom for many. Now, in our world, we only usually use that word or hear that word ransom in the instance of a kidnapping where someone makes a payment in order to free a hostage. The the thoughts that they would have had back then would have had to do with slavery. There was a price on the head of a slave that if they could earn enough money themselves or someone else, they could purchase their freedom, pay the ransom price so that they would be freed from slavery, but then they would be in debt to the person that had paid off that ransom. It's a concept that's talked about in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, when it says, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Or what the Heidelberg Catechism is talking about in question and answer one, when it says that my only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own, but I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus knew that he was going to Jerusalem to die because he knew that death was the ransom price that had to be paid in order to set the disciples, the church fathers, and you and I free from our enslavement to sin, to rescue us from hell and to save our very souls. I'm going to be expounding on a very similar point tonight at our evening worship service, so I don't want to overstate it this morning, but for the purpose of this first message, we need to just take a moment and be amazed by that truth. Knowing the rest of the story, as we watch Jesus walk toward Jerusalem, toward his execution, we should be amazed that he would do all of that to someone like me. And because he did that for us, for all who believe in his name and have faith in him, then we not, need not be afraid anymore of God. He moved that fear, he removed that fear for us. Back on the Mount of Transfiguration, we got a glimpse of the true glory of who Jesus was that he had in heaven before he came to this earth. And in many ways in this text, we get just a glimpse of the nature of what Jesus came to do. In watching him walk toward Jerusalem, we get a glimpse of the decision that he made with the Father and the Spirit to leave the glories of heaven and come to this earth so that he could suffer and die and pay your ransom price in order to set you free. What an amazing act of grace that Christ has given for you. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, as we witness Jesus walking toward Jerusalem, knowing full well that what awaited him there was nothing short of abuse and pain and harm, we remember why he went there. And in light of what he was willing to sacrifice, we praise you that he is our Savior, come to pay that ransom price, that price that we earned and that we owe because of our rejection of you. Thank you for being that Savior. May we, your people, always be amazed at what an incredible gift that was. And may that amazement stir our hearts to look like you and to serve you better. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who is our Savior. Amen. We're not going to reread our text, but as I had mentioned... Uh, the last sermon focusing on the work of Jesus, this, tech, this sermon is going to focus on discipleship. Now, as much as we were encouraged to be amazed at what Jesus did in our first sermon, we are also can't help but be amazed by the disciple in this text, but for very different reasons. It's kind of fun to read each commentary in the different ways that they try to talk about how ridiculous these disciples get and how 
thick skulled they were in not understanding things. It went from one commentator saying that they were feeling a, a ponderous sense of redundancy at the situation to another one stating it much more simply and clearly, they just don't get it, period. The disciples do not understand again. And that's the frustration. Jesus hardly gets the words out of his mouth talking about what awaits him in Jerusalem and all of the things that he's going to give as the servant of God for the third time when immediately the brothers James and John have a question to ask him about what they can get from Jesus. They figure that the general conversations that have been going on amongst the disciples have never been fully resolved. And so if they don't take the initiative, somebody else might. And so they're just going to come right out and they're going to ask Jesus for a favor. Of course, they start with the old kid's trick. Can you promise to give me something before I actually ask what it is? They say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Imagine starting your prayers that way. God, I'm talking to you right now, and I want you to give me everything I'm about to ask for. And what do they want? They want to sit on the right and the left of Jesus in his glory. The answer Jesus gives to their question is actually re quite revealing. He says to them, you do not understand what you're asking for. And that's the whole problem right there. In their minds, once again, the idea of sitting at the right and the left hand of Jesus was the idea of being in places of prominence, of being recognized as the greatest below Jesus in his kingdom. They would have power. They would have authority. They would be recognized as those who were responsible and in charge of great many things. But the reality is that the only time that we will ever see someone at the right and left of Jesus is when Jesus' arms are spread out on the cross and there are criminals to his right and to his left. James and John do not understand what they're asking for. Which is why Jesus says, can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I will have? And again, thinking about a victory cup and of a baptism into a position being anointed as a leader, both James and John say, yes, we certainly can. And looking into the future, knowing that many years from now, John and James will indeed also suffer also be rejected and persecuted because of their ongoing relationship with Jesus and their carrying on of his mission, Jesus acknowledges that indeed they will drink that cup and have that baptism. But again, not at all in the way that they are imagining. So this is what James and John do, but the other ten disciples are watching, and as soon as they see the stunt that James and John pull, they are mad. They are indignant, as the text says. Now, they're not indignant or mad for the right reasons, saying, what are, you, what are you talking about? Didn't you just hear what Jesus said? Why are you asking this? Haven't you heard what he said before? No, they're mad because James and John beat them to the punch. This is the only time in Mark, besides when James and John were called, that Peter isn't mentioned with them. They're trying to elbow Peter out of any kind of role or responsibility. They're trying to be the first in the line. They're saying that, hey, if you guys aren't going to ask, we're going to step out and do it. And the other disciples are mad, not because they wanted to ask Jesus the same thing. Maybe they were making, waiting for a more appropriate time or a, a more quiet time where they could pull Jesus and say, hey, we've been talking about this. Can you finally settle the matter? And this is the opportunity, by the way, the, the threat to totally derail this whole thing. That's what happens when you start arguing over power and authority. It divides people. It causes them to be upset because you want to be the one who has say over other people rather than letting other people have say over your life. Which is why, once again, Jesus pulls his disciples together and he reminds them of what he said before. 
This time he does it by contrasting the way that Gentiles rule. And here we're talking more about just the worldly view of what power and authority is versus what kingdom and discipleship looks like in his kingdom. The Gentiles, Jesus say, like to rule over other people. They seek to influence through power. They get the power that, so that they can dictate to others how they will live and what to do. But again, that's not how the disciples of Jesus are to act. They serve, period. They don't manipulate. They don't dominate. They don't worry about power. They worry about how they can help and bless others. The model that they look to is not kings, but slaves. And again, Jesus was the very one who was setting that model for them. In all that he gave up, he could have been glorified. In his glory, even the angels dare not look upon his face. But here he was, having sacrificed all of that in order to serve. And this is where we have to really start asking ourselves some tough questions about this text. Because as much as we want to shake our heads at the disciples and wonder after all that they had heard, how did they not get it yet? We, ask to all, we have to also ask ourselves, yeah, but do we get it yet? Do I? They're stumbling through this as it's happening. They're figuring it out in real time. They didn't know how this story was truly going to end. But we do. We gather here each week to hear God's word proclaimed to us. We've been disciples and students of Jesus since, for most of us, a very young age. We have heard these things over and over again. And yet, I wonder if we, too, are still prone to misunderstand it and miss the point. So what is your prayer life like? If we were to log everything that you prayed for and keep track of it, how do you view your prayers to God? Is it primarily about what you want to get from God? Asking that he will just give you a life of health, happiness, protect you from all struggles and any trials that would come your way. Or is your prayer life saying, your will be done in my life? Whatever that will looks like. We see Jesus talk critically about how Gentiles like to view and use power to exercise authority over others. And yet, how many Christians are really concerned about things like positions of power, elections, and, and, and chairmen, chair people of boardrooms? Too many Christians, I fear, are worried about, well, what we need to do is get the power ourselves. And once we do that, then we will be in charge and we'll be able to say, this is how things are going to be run. Now, to be abundantly clear, of course, we should be concerned about elections. We should pray for them as we did this morning. And it is hopeful and important that we try to encourage those who are seeking those positions. We desire them to lead well. But don't miss what Jesus is saying here. My way of influencing and changing the world doesn't come through the way of the Gentiles of seeking and imposing authority on others. Instead, it comes through service. That is how you change the world. And so if this is what discipleship is all about, then the questions need to be asked. How are you serving? Who are you serving? What have you sacrificed in order to be a disciple of Jesus? Now, if you're someone who has been listening well and applying these texts, I would imagine that any true disciple of Jesus would be able to answer those questions pretty easily and pretty readily. This is how I'm serving. This is who I'm serving. And these are some of the things that I have sacrificed. Not so that I can pat myself on the back, but because I want to be like Jesus. 
Similarly, if you don't know what you've sacrificed, if you can't identify anyone or any way that you are currently serving, then just maybe you too are missing the whole point. Again, as a community, the whole reason why I wanted to work through the book of Mark and to look at it is because we need to wrestle with these questions. What does true discipleship really look like? And are we pursuing that in our lives and as a community? Do we get it yet? We have so many more resources. We know so much more than the disciples ever did. And yet, we so often can still look like those who are seeking our glory and our praise rather than Jesus's. And again, the whole point of this text in terms of being a disciple of Christ is that I surrender and I serve that I follow the one who was walking toward Jerusalem, sacrificing everything in order to bless me, and that I'm called to do the very same. Let's pray. Lord God, as we shake our heads at the disciples, I do pray that we would too get it, that we would understand that a life of discipleship is indeed a life of service, a life where we are seeking ways to not dominate other people and to receive praise for ourselves, but to serve others and lift them up as our brothers and sisters. We do that because we want to be like you, and we do that because we want to love them. And so, Father, as we do, again, look at these texts that talk about what it means to be a disciple, I pray that we not only learn more of what that really means, but I pray that in the lives that we live, we show that we understand true discipleship by the choices we make. May we sacrifice anything that gets in the way of our relationship with you. And may we serve anyone who comes in our path so that they might be blessed And may the world be changed by a community of servants being raised up in obedience to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.